Welcome to part two of why the housing market will crash. This $256 billion bond guru says soft landing is a fairy tale. US inflation might be cooling, but Arif Hassan says bond yields are going higher just as the economy starts to crack and there's very little to catch us on the way down. The 5% bond market means pain is heading everyone's way. Not so long ago, families, businesses, and governments were effectively living in a world of free money. The US Federal Reserve's benchmark interest rate was zero, while central banks in Europe and Asia even ran negative rates to stimulate economic growth after the financial crisis and through the <clears throat> those days and now look to be over and everything from housing to mergers and acquisitions are being upended, especially after the 30-year US Treasury bond yields this week punched through 5% for the first time since 2007. Yields got another boost on Friday after bigger than expected surge in US payrolls that bolster the case for more Fed rate hikes. Expect more pain in stocks and commercial real estate. As risk-free government bond yields surge towards 5% thanks to higher for longer interest rates, there are profound consequences for the price of everything, which is what I've been saying for a long time, that when the so-called risk-free government bond yield changes, that changes the price of every other asset class, including housing. Now, remember this, back 2007, August 6, 2007, February 15, 2007, September 26, 2007, February 14, 2007, Feb 28, 2007, everything was about soft landing. And what have we been hearing? Soft landing. A rise in bond yields typically ends with a financial accident. Once again, history tells us that something's going to happen. What's going to happen? Well, the 10-year, in my opinion, Still has more upside to go, and I'll show you a reason why in a second. It's going to break. It's going to break financial markets. It's going to break credit markets. It's going to break the housing market. So I've shared this chart before. Super cycles in US and Australian bond yields. Yeah, I've argued that house prices in particular, but really all asset classes, have been supported by a 40-year bond bull market. As interest rates continue to fall, increasing people's borrowing capacity, uh, changing the price of uh, all asset classes, has been a tailwind, especially for property. But now we're in a bond bear market, and I believe we're going to be in a bond bear market over the coming decade, now rates don't go up in a straight line, rates don't go down in a straight line. So I expect the same thing to happen. But over the cycle, we're in a bond bear market. So just a 10 year treasury yield. So what I say to investors or what I do myself is I go back and study different time periods. You know, what asset classes did well in bond bull markets? What asset classes did well in bond bear markets? I can tell you it's going to be a very, very tough gig for real estate moving forward. If, if as I believe we are, in a new bond bear market. Now, historically, the 10-year always hits the Fed's peak rate in hiking cycles, and it hasn't done that yet. So the 10-year still has more room to move higher uh, before any dream of rate cuts, etc. In fact, there's still some more pressure on the, uh, the, the Fed uh, to raise again. And if they do, that just means that historically, if history is anything to go by, that uh, the 10-year has got more room to move before it it peaks out in this cycle. In fact, we could be in a bit of a doom loop here. Um, what I want to do now is just cut to a recent clip 
with Paul Tudor Jones, who actually talks about this potential doom loop. So black swans, Paul, are no, they're not black swans anymore. They're, they're actual quantifiable risks. We need a new word for black swans. There's like four or five of them that used to be, you didn't even have to really, if, if it happened, we're all gone anyway, so you don't worry about it. But now they're actually something that are on your radar. Well, yeah. so is a pandemic, which was on your radar in, in Davos before anyone knew the word. I, I would say the fiscal situation is very different from other cataclysmic events that we've suffered as a country. It's not Pearl Harbor. It's not 9-11. It's not COVID, where we did not see them coming. They were external shocks. The fiscal situation we have is one that's really clear, uh, and there are obvious remedies for it, and it's something that we're going to have to deal with. It's not part of the political dialogue yet, really. You're I don't think so. You're talking entitlements again. It, it, well, it's a variety of things. But so mostly. If, if you just think about what's happened in, since really in the last three or four months, we're getting ready. I don't know if we'll have a Minsky moment in the bond market. I don't know if we'll have that point of recognition, but we're going to have the grinding reality that with 122 percent of debt to GDP, as interest costs go up the United States, you get in this vicious circle where higher interest rates cause higher funding costs, cause higher debt issuance, which cause further bond liquidation, which cause higher rates, which put us in an untenable fiscal position. We our interest bill is going to very shortly exceed our defense spending in just a couple of years. Uh, our, it's probably in four or five years, Ceteris Paribus will have the highest interest bill as a percentage of GDP that we've ever had. It'll probably be close to 20 percent of your taxes will go to pay interest right. on the debt unless we do something. So, um, so clearly we are not in the same economic environment we have been last 40 years. Well, even since the global financial crisis. Um, a lot of people, and we're seeing it in our business, a lot of people are holding on to their properties. They are on the edge financially. They're holding on to their properties for, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it, the longer they can hold on, the higher the, the, the you know, if they are forced to sell, the more they're, they're going to get by holding on. You know, if they sell later on, because house prices just keep going up. Uh, they also believe the longer they can hold on, that interest rates are going to be cut, and they're going to be cut dramatically. A lot of people we survey, a lot of clients we speak to, they think interest rates are going back down to where they were uh, over the last few years. They're dreaming. The other, the other reason why they're holding on is there is a rental crisis. There is an absolute rental crisis and homeowners are afraid to, uh, to be in the position where they're fighting with two, 300 people for one particular property uh, at an open home for, for a rental. So they're scared of the rental market and I'd rather deal with the banks. But here you can see from this chart that the markets are actually predicting that, that um, interest rates will remain permanently higher. In fact, they're pricing in that the Fed funds will bottom at 4%. So throughout this cycle, the Fed funds, the market is predicting will bottom at 4% and then start rising again. So any hope that interest rates are going to go down to zero, the only way they're going down to zero is if we're facing a great depression like i'm talking 1929 1930s style depression where unemployment goes deep into double digits banks going under left right and center and then even then i'm skeptical so yeah rates are going to be higher for longer we have entered a new environment we are in a bond bear market and that changes the price of all other asset classes. Yet people have not woken up to that fact yet. I thought I'd share this chart, business versus household debt as a percentage of GDP. You can see lending to business in blue and lending to housing and personal lending. 
So there's definitely been a bubble in non-productive, and, and I'm going to talk about some of that non-productive stuff and how, especially in Australia, we actually have a very weak economy because we've been lending into uh, non-productive uh, sectors of the economy. And so we've, got, we've put ourselves in a very difficult position when it comes to uh, our debt levels as a percentage of GDP and as a percentage of income. And here we've got the uh, yield curve. And as you guys know, it's, all, it's been negative. But the real problem happens actually when it goes back being positive again. And we're not there yet, but it's moving there. But you know, this, is, uh, this is the deepest negative yield curve that we've had in recent memories. And you know, the way people t talk to me, clients and other people, we're fine. Economy is booming. Housing's going to double in price in the next few years. I mean, it's just ridiculous when all the economic signals say that we're heading for something very, very bad. Jeff Gunlock, the real Bond King. Stocks are pretty overvalued and the recession is likely to hit next nine months. Well, I don't know when the next, when the recession's going to hit. Uh, I can't time those things. Uh, but I know it's coming. The US Treasury yield curve is de-inverting very rapidly, as I was talking before. Was that minus 108 basis points a few months ago? Now it's minus 35 basis points. Should put everyone on recession warning, not just recession watch. If the unemployment rate ticks up just a couple of tenths, it will be recession alert. Buckle up. Just what I've been saying. Buckle up. And uh, I'll actually share probably either in the next video, um, part three or probably part four, would, depending on how long this goes for, uh, where my uh, unemployment predictions for Australia ends up. It's higher than where, where it's at. And that's also going to uh, be very bearish for real estate. And, you know, I would pay attention to Jeff's warnings here. If you don't want to listen to me, Perhaps listen to Jeff. Bill Ackman's big warning comes amid spooky GSC echoes as bond yields hit levels not seen since before the 2007 crash. Hedge fund titan Bill Ackman sees a wall of worry for investors in a higher for longer world. Higher for longer world. Going to change all asset prices. Don't know why people can't see that, but anyway. Drucken Miller says US on brink of a recession sees hard landing. He still predicts unbelievable opportunities in the coming years. There's always opportunities. I grew my business during the GFC. In fact, I doubled my business during the GFC. There's always opportunities. Jamie Dimon warns world may not be prepared for Fed at 7%. So the Fed at 7%, what do you think the RBA is going to do? Let's, say, let's just say that the Fed does go to 7%. I don't know if they do. I, I, I really don't. If, if the, if the you know, bond market can do a lot of the work for the Fed, maybe the Fed stays put. Um, they hang out for, for a while. But let's say Jamie Dimon is right and Fed funds go to 7%. Can the RBA afford to leave rates at 4.1% and have that big differential? What do you think is going to happen to the Aussie dollar? Don't worry, we're going to touch on that in our last uh, video series. So however long this goes for, if it's part three, part four, we'll touch on this in that, in that last one. But if the RBA don't raise and that differential you know, widens, that's going to put massive downward pressure on the Aussie dollar. There's going to be a massive sell-off in Aussie bonds. There's going to be a massive dump of Aussie dollars. There's going to be a big run to the US dollar. You know, it's, it's pretty basic stuff, but a lot of people just don't look into this sort of stuff. The RBA is not in control. Deutsche Bank studied 34 past US recessions to identify key warning signs and found that all four are flashing red right now. Everything I'm looking at is also flashing red right now. 
October is known for big drawdowns and charts suggest a capitulation event is likely, says Bank of America. Look, I don't time things. I'm not, I'm not a trader. The only trading I do is, is options. Dominantly sell, so on the market making side, dominantly sell options. Uh, we do buy leaps and we do buy puts and uh, some spreads. But we also, when we're buying options, we buy long dated options because I'm a hopeless timer. So don't ask me when because I don't know. Eventually something will break. JP Morgan strategist warns rising bond yields could unleash a financial accident. Keyword there is could. I say if it's longer, higher for longer, it will. The margin call moment. World now facing up to 70 trillion in global losses. Our monetary system is, is being pushed to the brink. We have a debt-based system. We are loaded up on debt on every different, you know, qualification or whatever you want to, whether it's debt to GDP, debt to income, whatever. We are loaded up on debt and interest rates are rising. We're also going to touch on what this means for corporate bonds and for zombies, for unemployment, etc. in the next video. But this is a big, big problem. So I did this video, Investor Returns 4,000% Using Austrian Economics. Mark Spitznagel. Now, I should have probably added this in the last video, because the last video was talking about the Austrian business cycle theory. So I should have probably added this bit in the previous video. But anyway, I'm sharing it with you now. Who is Mark Spitznagel? Well, he founded the Hedge Fund Universal Investments in 2007. He has huge returns. The Wall Street Journal actually reported that a strategy of 3.3% positions in Universa, with the rest passively in the S&P 500, would have compounded at 12.3% in the 10 years through to 2018. And that excludes his over 4,000 cent return in March 2020, which also beats our 780% return that we did um, in March 2020 using similar strategies. So those of you who don't know, I've done videos in the past where we shared uh, how we made 780% return in March 2020. In fact, it was in about two and a half weeks, we, we made a 780% return. According to figures audited by Ernst & Young, Universa posted a 105% life-to-date average annual return on invested capital between the 1st of January 2008 and December 31st, 2019. According to the New York Times, Spitznagel predicted the dot-com bubble bursting, the 2008 global financial crisis, and the 2000s commodity boom. So you got the trifecta. Uh, I don't know if you guys are horse racing fans, but if you're out there and you see someone who is able to predict the trifecta, win the trifecta, yeah, if you you probably want to listen to him and get some tips from him on what horses to bet on the following races, right? Pretty good little track record. Also, 105% life-to-date average annual return on invested capital. Uh, I think it's wise to listen to Mark Spitznagel. So Mark said, uh, he told Fortune in a recent interview that we're in the greatest credit bubble in human history. The Universa Investments boss said, we're in the greatest credit bubble in human history, and that's not my opinion, that's just numbers. Added that we're living in an age of leverage, an age of credit, and it will have consequences. Spitznagel, whose fund specialises in hedging against extreme and unpredictable tail risks, was referring to ballooning amounts of household and federal debt. He predicted steeper borrowing costs would hinder economic growth, force governments to restrict their spending, and lead to central banks keeping interest rates lower than they'd like. Universe's founder and chief investor also paying the Fed for cutting rates to almost zero and buying excessive amounts of bonds during the cough period. And that's the Austrian business cycle there. If you listen to 
part one. And if you haven't listened to part one, please go back and do that before you, you know, watch the rest of this video or at least watch, watch it after you've watched this video. Because the Austrian business cycle theory is the, my basis, my foundation for why I'm bearish housing. The central bank's loose monetary policy may have staved off a recession, he said, but it also drove up asset prices and debt levels to dangerous highs, paving the way for a much bigger disaster down the line. That's really the Austrian business cycle theory in that crack-up boom, as I, as I mentioned. So please watch part one. Spitznagel says he's worried about what he calls the greatest credit bubble in human history and a tinderbox economy. Spitznagel believes the rising interest expense on federal government debts will ultimately constrain fiscal spending, slow economic growth, and force central banks to keep interest rates lower than many now forecast. He pointed to the fact that net interest payments on U.S. government debt are estimated to total $395.5 billion this fiscal year, or 6.8% of entire 2023 federal budget according to the Office of Management and Budget. The hedge funder equated the Fed's interventionist policy since the GFC, including its decision to slash interest rates to near zero and buy government bonds and mortgage-backed securities, a policy called quantitative easing, or simply QE, during the cough period. Are we allowed to say the real world now on, on YouTube? I don't know. To firefighters mismanaging a wilderness area. So that's what he... he equated it to. When smaller forest fire fires aren't allowed to burn away excess vegetation, it can lead to even bigger, more uncontrollable fires down the road. Similarly, by not allowing the economy to fall into recession, i.e. face a small fire, through the use of near zero interest rates and QE, the Fed boosted asset prices and debts to an unsustainable level and created a financial tinderbox that is ready to burn, according to Spitznagel. We've never seen anything like this level of total debt and leverage in the system. It's an experiment, he said. But we know that credit bubbles have to pop. We don't know when, but we know they have to. So I think that my tinderbox metaphor holds. And what he's just recently said uh, as well is this is a fundamental problem. It is a fundamental trap. It's going to be really bad. I think we should worry more about deflation. I think that is a huge risk people aren't thinking about. If the Fed pops this bubble, there will be a deflationary spiral. It is going to cause devastation. So absolutely, if interest rates remain high and we start seeing the credit market blow up and we start to see uh, whether it's corporates, households start defaulting, on debts, then we're going to have debt destruction, which is money destruction, which is deflation, and asset prices are going to tumble. So those of you who want to know more about Mark Spitznagel, I recommend to check out his book, Safe Haven, Investing for Financial Storms. Uh, that's, yeah, a bit mathematical type book. Could be hard for some people to read. But one of my favorite books of all time. It's absolutely on my book, recommended book that I recommend everyone. And it had a big impact on me as an investor. And that's The Dow of Capital, Austrian Investing in a Distorted World. In fact, my whole journey to Austrian economics was because I, I realized that so many of the best investors that I was following we're using Austrian economics as a foundation or they're talking about Austrian economics. And I was like, what is this Austrian economics? You know, I was in the Adam Smith and, you know, even uh, the Chicago school, the, the Milton Friedman, you know, I was all for capitalism, you know, free markets and whatnot. I, I knew Hayek. Uh, I knew who Hayek was. I, I had heard of Mises. I had heard of Rothbard. But um, Bombarwerk and Menger and all the other greats I'd never heard of before. But it was because of the really top investors and Mark Spitznagel, another one. So uh, it just confirmed that using Austrian economics is, a, is my edge as an investor. So I, I really recommend his book, The Dow of Capital, Austrian Investing in a Distorted World. 
um, which is about the Austrian School of Economics and its ostensible application to investing. In fact, billionaire investor Paul Tudor Jones said of Spitznagel's book that it shows how a seemingly difficult immediate loss becomes an advantageous intermediate step for greater future gain, and thus why we must become patient now and strategically impatient later. So go get that book if you want to know more about Mark Spitznagel. So this video is all about the bond market and how we've been in a 40-year bond bull market, which has really pushed asset prices up, created a huge debt bubble, and people's recency bias means that they think this is the norm and that asset prices just keep going up and up and up and up and up. It's not the case. And not in the next video, but the one after that, I'm actually going to give some resources for especially Aussie housing investors or Aussie homeowners or mortgage holders. I'm going to give you some resources that actually follow the Australian property market going right back into the 19th century all the way through. So if you really want to do a dig dive on, on how Aussie property has performed over a long, long period of time in different periods, um, stay tuned for that because I'll, I'll share that resource with you. Um, we're now in a bond bear market and what Mark is arguing is, is basically that we are going to have this deflationary uh, pop when the, when the bubble credit bubble pops, when the debt bubble pops and, and then central banks will cut. And that's the only way central banks are going to cut significantly. Otherwise we're higher for longer. And in fact, when they cut, I think we see a version of MMT and yeah, we're, 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 we backed ourselves in a corner and it's going to be very nasty no matter which way uh, governments and central banks go, you know, save the currency or save asset prices. What are they going to do? Look, in our next video, I'm going to leave it here. In our next video, uh, I'm going to share more about the corporate bond market, and which isn't getting talked about. Zombies, uh, the amount of uh, corporate debt that's rolling off onto much, much higher interest rates over the next uh, few years, what that's going to mean for unemployment, and obviously what unemployment is going to mean for housing. That's going to mean a big deal. No one is talking about this at the moment. And once again, it's a it's a red alert that's flashing and not many people are, are talking about it. We're also going to touch on immigration in our next video because a lot of people say to me, but Steve, government's just going to, the government's going to save it. The government's going to save it and they'll just bring in a lot of people. And inflation, and sorry, immigration is what's pushing up house prices. In the next one, I'm going to argue that Immigration is not pushing up house prices, but it's people's belief that immigration is pushing up house prices. Therefore, they're going out and getting debt and buying property. So they themselves have created their own FOMO and they're the cause of the demand for housing. Rental. Rental is another uh, thing. Immigration is having an impact on uh, the rental market and so is uh, Airbnb. But we'll touch on that in the next video. So thanks for joining, and I'll see you then. And just a reminder, the information provided in this video is for education and entertainment purposes only. Nothing on this channel constitutes as financial advice. The information in this presentation is no substitute for financial advice, and all investors should seek advice from a licensed financial advisor having regard to your own objectives, financial situation, and needs. Mm -hmm.